And stream started. We can get going. Uh, as soon as I actually put the mouse over the thing. So we'll start with the usual logistics thing. So um, if you're hungry, I brought donuts today. And they're in the back corner. That's why nobody actually saw them when they came in the door. I was like, oh, that'll be a good place to put them. Um, so feel free to get up and grab yourself a donut. There are some napkins there as well. They're not fancy. Um, there's not a lot of options at 7 o'clock in the morning. But Rekka still has decent donuts. I mean, they're not luckies. Those are just kind of decadent, over-the-top donuts. But thank you for coming in. Thank you for being here on what is close to um, the last day before you hopefully go do something that isn't related to distributed consensus. I think we have consensus on that. Um, and for those of you who are, are not here, for those of you who are not here, um, too bad. The donuts might be here if you rush in, um, but I'm sure they'll disappear in subsequent classes. Uh, not much changed here. Uh, we're still, we haven't actually created the project three reports yet. Lackers that we are. Um, I was up until 11 o'clock last night writing uh, reviews on computer science education papers. Because they, people don't do their reviews on time, so they look for late, you know, for emergency reviews. And I was like, they gave them to me early in the morning and wanted them back right away. They got tacked on to the end of the day. So I now know more about um, uh, CS uptake in Scottish um, elementary education and secondary education than I ever wanted to know. And they had this really interesting paper, too, about a metacognitive tool. Um, is anybody familiar with the concept of metacognition? So cognition is how you, how you learn things and how you um, process them. And so metacognition is about studying the way that you learn things. So in other words, it's a how do I best learn stuff, and that's individual. Um, there, there are patterns when we look at large groups of individuals, but your particular way of effectively learning information is going to be different than mine or different than his or different than hers. Um, and it was this really interesting sounding tool. And I managed to, to narrow down the list of universities that it could possibly have been used at to a very small number. Um, they used a quarter system. So it wasn't UBC. Um, and it wouldn't have been UBC anyway, because that would have, they would have conflicted me out on that. Um, and there was something else. There were a couple of other things. It was an R1 research institution in North America on a 10-week system. And I actually immediately thought that it might be where I went to undergrad because we were on a, on a quarter system. Uh, but I did manage to get it down to of like a handful of schools. Because quarter systems are kind of unusual. But I didn't, quite, I didn't quite break the anonymity on it. At any rate, so I'm constantly looking at these kinds of things because I think that the most valuable things you can come away from here is to understand how you learn these things. So, Helping people learn to learn better. What is it? There's a there's a a learning how to learn course on I think Coursera or something. Um, and then they have like a, a a thing they send out every week, um, and it's very very popular and it's very interesting because it's like you can learn the, the that whole process of learning yourself. And then I had a nice chat with ChatGPT. Um, which was itself very insightful and interesting. It actually maintains context. So I don't know if you've ever played with this old tool from like the 70s called Eliza, but it was pretty much a parrot. It would take what you said, re rephrase it, and, and reflect it back to you. And people were like really freaked out by how effective it was. Um, well, ChatGPT is in essence just a much more refined version of that, but it actually maintains context which I thought was interesting. And all the research groups are talking about it right now. Um, and ChatGPT assures me that it will actually be very useful for my research. 
Uh, again, nothing much changed here. So we'll get to readings. So there's actually um, an interesting list of papers here. Um, originally, I was going to make this lecture do stamp replication and raft because they're pretty much the same protocol. And after putting the slides together, I said, you know what? I just want to go through view stamp replication first. And then when we come back, I'll go through raft. Um, and I have plenty of time to do that. And I'd rather spend a little more time. I've never gone through the view stamp replication protocol as thoroughly as I did in preparing today's lecture. And what I like about it, and next time I teach this, I'm going to do it in the opposite order, I would do this before I do Paxos. And the reason for that is that view stamp replication is pretty much quorum replication with views. And that makes it easier for you to make that transition. Whereas Paxos is this crazy ass thing where you've got you know, different, different pieces and proposers and learners and acceptors. And it's not that different, but the language that, that Lamport uses to describe things is quite different. When you look at how view stamp replication works, it harkens back to forum replication being able to get read quorum and write quorum. And when you have an intersection of those two things, you have a guarantee. Um, crumbling Walls, which I didn't spend a lot of time talking about, is a generalization of Gifford's work on uh, quorum replication, read, read quorum and write quorum. And it basically says, as long as you have an intersection of a read quorum and a write quorum, it works. And it doesn't have to be a majority of the nodes. And the reason that's important is because if we insist on the two-phase commit transactional model, we have a very difficult time maintaining aliveness. And aliveness is important to us in distributed systems. You don't want to go to Amazon and try to put something in your cart and have it just sit there and wait until all of the underlying servers have become available. Like, why? Make this work. I just want to buy my toilet paper and have you ship it to me, or whatever it is you buy on Amazon. I bought plant food this morning. I grow peppers, very hot peppers. I'm really excited. My Carolina Reapers are actually blooming now. So, Anybody know hot peppers? You know what a Carolina Reaper is then, don't you? They don't come any hotter than that. I've been growing ghost peppers for like five years now, and I have like jars and jars and jars of um, dried ghost peppers. Wow. You won't be thinking about distributed consensus with those. I brought that mask in, my, my P100 mask, and that's actually so I can grind them and turn them into powdered ghost pepper. Because you do not want to get ghost pepper, especially powdered ghost pepper, anywhere near your eyes or your mouth or your nose or pretty much any other part of your body. Um, the, so, so I still have, the reason I was mentioning the, the whole uh, division here is because I added the uh, last two as a discussion of raft and i really do recommend the uh the heidi howard video the last one there she does a phenomenal job of actually talking about paxos and raft and how they compare to each other and so if you're having a problem digesting that whole paxos discussion i i, I highly recommend that there's a lot of supplementary material on Paxos available. Uh, interestingly enough, there's very little on view stamp replication, even though of these three protocols, view stamp replication is the oldest by far. Question in the back, sir. Um, those slides are already up. The, on the only thing that I changed with them is I added the donut slide, and then I made um, slight changes to the format. But I put them up last night. Are they not there? Did I fail to push update again? All right, yes. I know I did this yesterday. All right, I'm not going to fix it right now. Um, yes, I have the slides. They will definitely be available. Um, I went through a lot of trouble to add all of this stuff, and I swear I pushed the update button. But maybe I didn't go back and look and see that the update button didn't clear itself. I don't know. It was a long day yesterday. Anybody have any questions? Is anybody awake? Well, that's good. If I gave you some ghost pepper, you'd be awake, too. 
it makes a very nice hot sauce. You know, when I make hot sauce with it, it's like I take three little ghost peppers and I put a lot of onions and tomatoes and garlic in it, and it still is really hot. I like to add it to macaroni and cheese. So good. Any funny stories to share? I didn't think so. Um, today's failure is going to be a little more hand wavy, and it's mostly because it's based upon a story that was given to me by uh, Andy Warfield, who is still adjunct faculty here. At the time I started, he was actually an um, associate professor, and he had just come back from a multi year uh, leave of absence, and then he stayed here for nine months, and then quit and went to Amazon. Um, see, Amazon sucks up all the talent. So it turns out that building data centers, the places where we implement all of our distributed consensus algorithms, is itself a very complex field. And they have to consider lots of interesting issues. And believe me, they can get these wrong. And when they get them wrong, our systems fail. There are tons and tons of sources of these failures. And today's is just an amusing one. In a facility, you have to worry about how much space you have. You have to worry about how much power consumption you're going to use. The largest consumer of power in a data center is actually cooling. It was a conversation that I was either in or saw where somebody was talking about how um, the data center, I think I was reading it, um, the data center they worked in had the cooling to keep the humans cool because the computers were all liquid cooled and therefore the heat was being removed and they could run much, much hotter than the humans who actually had to work on the computers were able to do. So cooling is a huge, huge issue. Security. In many cases, you might work for a company that has distributed systems running in data centers, and you will never have physical access to that data center. Decades ago, when I first started going to Microsoft's campus, 90, yeah, I know, before you were born. I'm used to it. Um, it was still a very pretty wooded lot, and um, it was... It, they had a building, I think it was building 11, that was the highest security building they had on campus because it was their, their, their IT infrastructure building. And you couldn't get into that unless you were somebody very specifically allowed in because IT infrastructure is critical to the success of the business. How do you manage these kinds of buildings? Anybody studied cyber physical systems? Anybody studied computer security? You know, you get into computer security and we talk about passwords and we talk about cryptography and we talk about all these things and the ways that we walk down our systems. And then you get into cyber physical systems and all those rules get thrown out because the moment that you start putting any kind of access controls inside of a high security physical system, you are asking for trouble because the worst thing in the world is, oh my gosh, the nuclear power plant is just going into meltdown and I can't remember my password. So it's literally the opposite design philosophy, which is that, in fact, management in that instance is one of the few times you will see it over shadow security. Um, I did a back, backstage tour of the um, aquarium in Atlanta one time when I was there. And... It was really cool because I had been studying cyber physical systems and I walk in and I see all the things we talked about. They have all these physical monitors and all the physical plants and they had these big ass displays that you could basically shut things down from and there were no controls on them at all. That's why they have very strong perimeter defense. If you're inside that perimeter, you are essentially trusted. So really hard systems build, complicated. Um, uh, yeah, right. So then we have the infrastructure, the actual things that we're going to put inside of this data center. We have our servers, which run in racks and blades, and um, you know they, 
they probably doing it a little more formally than you do with your, your um, you know, Raspberry Pi server sitting in a closet someplace with no ventilation. You can get away with that with a Raspberry Pi. And then, have you seen people build Raspberry Pi clusters? So cool. You can actually build your own little cluster and test your distributed systems with computers that cost you $60 and get very interesting behaviors and results. Uh, storage. In fact, a lot of the space that is used in a data center isn't CPU. It's actually SSDs, mostly flash memory these days, sometimes rotating disks, occasionally other kinds of media. Turns out that connecting all of this stuff together is really important. So we have very complex networks. And then we have cables that connect all of these machines together. And if you go into a big data center, then just the cabling, you go. As they began to grow the size of these data centers, they put things into racks. And they actually would build the racks before they would even bring them into the data center. And then they would start installing these racks together so that they had extra racks. So if a rack failed, they just simply turned it off and turn, turned on the one next to it or switched things over to the one next to it. So literally, these racks are built so that you don't fix the individual components. When the rack starts to fail and it's no longer viable, they bring a forklift in and they remove the rack and they replace it. It's a completely different model. So you can start to see why this is complicated and why they organize things to deal with failure as well. Had you ever thought that maybe the right thing to do is to not remove the individual failing component, but instead to remove the rack? And if enough of the data center shuts down or is, is offline, maybe you just have to replace the data center. They literally have to do things at this scale. For a while, as Amazon was trying to convince people to move data into the cloud, they had a customized project where they would literally build a custom truck, trailer actually, they would build this whole thing into a trailer, and it was like a little mini cloud, mostly for storage. And they would then take it to some company. They would transfer all of the data to it, and then take it to Amazon and plug it all in and move all the data into the data center itself. The most expensive thing that we do in distributed systems is move data. Well, what do we do when the power goes out? Well, we switch on generators. Fire up the old nuclear reactor. That's supposed to be funny because, in fact, nuclear reactors are the one thing that you tend to keep running all the time. Um, they take a long time to start up and they take a long time to shut down, measured in days or weeks or months or years. And of course, you have to manage all this stuff. But what about the plumbing? See, I'm a file systems person, and basically file systems are plumbing. For most people, the only time they bitch about their file system is when it doesn't work. And it's pretty much the same as the way your plumbing is, right? You go to the tap, you turn the tap on, the water comes out, you just assume that's the way it is. And in some parts of the world, that is the way it is. And then there are other parts of the world where you go, and the first thing they tell you is, don't drink the water. Has anybody been to a place like that? Yeah. And did you drink the water anyway? Did you get sick? Maybe. <laughs> so many different things. I was out eating street food, and I was drinking water straight from the tap. And you know, hey, it's Delhi. How hard could it be? You know, it can't be that bad, right? I mean, I was warned to not buy bottled water from the street vendors because they will put the lids back on and glue them down. So you're still drinking tap water. Well, at any rate. Uh, it turns out that water is a waste product for certain things. Um, generators, some generators will actually produce wastewater. A big one for this is actually air conditioning. And uh, so the Andy Warfield story was where they actually had a data center. They had, he said it was a, a, a power generator, but I suspect it was probably actually a, an air conditioning unit that was above the data center. Well, OK, so putting something that generates water over a whole bunch of electronics, I can tell you from personal experience, is not a good idea. That happened in the sixth floor of the X-Wing, where Marco's brand new $3.1 million worth of equipment had just been installed the month before, and a sprinkler went off. 
Oh, the worst part is the facilities people had previously had this happen. Because it happened to Andy's equipment like 10 years ago. And, and they never really fixed the problem. And it turns out the computers and water don't fix. Well, actually, if there's no power in the computer, you're fine. Dry it out. Life is good. If it's running, it turns out that water is a reasonable conductor of electricity and you get all sorts of current flow across things that really shouldn't be flowing across and it, it burns it out. Yeah, it'll probably take Margo another five years to get that $3.1 million of equipment replaced, at which point it'll all be obsolete. Oh well. So in this case, they had a backup generator or an air conditioner or something installed in this room above the data center and they, they, what they did was they turned it on just as part of a test. But for some reason, the line that took the water away, because you, so you put something that generates water, you put it in a pan, you know, like a shower pan, and there's a drain. But the drain wasn't big enough. So eventually, it filled up with water, and then it proceeded to overflow into a running data center, because this was just a test. And it took the data center out. So that's today's failure. Plumbing matters. Things you never even think of failing will fail. I'm just going to talk about view stamp replication. As I said, I started with this idea that I was going to do view stamp replication and raft, and then I, I, I lifted a very nice, really nice set of slides. I really like them, and I hope you like them too, um, about view stamp replication, which is not something people talk about a lot, and I don't quite know why, because it's pretty cool. Um, and it's, I think it's simpler to understand than Paxos. And Paxos and view stamp replication are similar ages. Uh, Oki and Liskov published this paper in 1988. Uh, Lamport submitted Paxos for publication in 1990, but he was working on it in the 80s, late 80s. And they are not the same protocol. Raft, on the other hand, was proposed in 2014. 2015, I don't, I'd have to be 2013 or 2015 because it was SOSP and that's only every other year. And the primary selling point for Raft wasn't that it was a novel new consensus algorithm, it was that it was easier for people to understand. And literally, at the presentation, someone said, how does this differ from view stamp replication? I wasn't at that particular SOSP, but I've talked to people who were. And, and Ongaro, the grad student from John, for John Osterhout, which you were asking about file systems before. Uh, Osterhout uh, was, Mendel Rosenbaum was Osterhout's student, and he was at Berkeley. They were both all at Berkeley at the same time as Margo, and um, Mendel gets credit for doing log structured file system. Margo is the one who actually made it work, but Mendel is uh, working under John, is the one who, uh, who got something running initially. And that's like the last big change to the way that we organize file systems uh, data in a long, long time. So I really like this view. I, I really like view stamp replication. I think it's a lot easier to understand, especially since we spent so much time talking about quorum replication, because it's really just an extension to quorum replication. And it's a clever extension, because it handles the problem of what do we do when our, our leader fails, our primary. So view stamp replication, like most of these distributed consensus algorithms, actually all of these distributed consensus algor algorithms we're talking about, relate to what is called state machine replication. Right? I talked about that on Tuesday. We have the same state machine running in all of our nodes. And what we're doing is we're essentially trying to make sure that they are all kept in sync. That's a nice, clean model. It's why we can build a discrete event simulator like the framework in the DS labs that we're using in order to explore how we build replicated state machines. How many of you know what a state machine is? Eh, hand wavy, hand wavy, maybe, yeah, right. Um, it didn't take 421. So you get state machines in those. But state machines are really just, they're actually the way that computers really work. To be honest, you start, if you go look at a processor manual, it will say, um, here are my inputs and here are my outputs. And what it's doing is it's getting a message, the inputs, 
And based upon the message it receives, it moves into a different state. So it changes something about where it's at. Like flow diagrams or little bubbles that you know, point you and describe algorithms. Maybe you did some of that in an algorithms course, right? And this is just that on steroids. We, we take the same basic idea and then we replicate it in other places. And the goal in having a state machine is that it gives us a nice deterministic pattern and that's what allows us to send those messages between things. Determinism is something I have stressed multiple times and I'll stress it here again. In order to make these things work, we assume deterministic behavior. The moment we start putting any kind of randomness into things, it makes it harder for us to reason about. And you see that when we start allowing messages to arrive out of order. You see that when we start allowing network losses because it's not quite non-determinism. Well, it is non-determinism, non but it's a, a, a restricted form of non-determinism that we can still reason about. But the reason that makes this so hard is that we have to reason about it. If we end up with a system where all of the communications are absolutely perfect, messages never get lost, they never get, the, the, the order is never changed, and we have a global ordering of things, it's really easy. And that's the world that most applications run in, or they think they run in. We are the glue that makes that illusion mostly work. But we know, according to FLP, we can't really make it always work. So you can watch the magicians do their sleight of hand. Anybody ever seen a magician in person? It's very different than watching it on a recording. Seeing it in person, you're always like, it, because it's, it's a trick of misdirection, right? And that's kind of what we're doing here. We're giving you this service that we, we, you look at and you think, this is deterministic, and it works this easy way for me to reason about. Because application programmers are wonderful people, but they're not very bright. That's why you're in systems. Our goal in view stamp replication is strong consistency across replicas. When you look at project three, that was strong replication across a primary and a backup. So we had two copies, two replicas of the database, and we were keeping them in sync. Two phase commit is a strong consistency protocol. But the problem with that is it doesn't scale up very well. When we saw chain replication, we saw crack, we saw different kinds of things that we tried to do in order to get better performance out of our system. Because, because me making a decision is faster than me making a decision that I have to coordinate with you. Because we have to agree on what the outcome is. It just takes longer. And that makes intuitive sense to us. If we add more than just me and you, we add everybody in this classroom, hopefully there's an odd number because it makes things much easier to deal with. If we add everybody in this classroom, it takes even longer. And so the reason we have these distributed consensus algorithms is that, that don't require um, everybody agree, is we want to keep moving forward. We want liveness in our system. Otherwise, we sit around trying to decide what we're going to have for dinner tonight. Um, this is Oki's PhD work, actually. So that means he was doing it in probably 85, 86, 87, and it was published in 88. So our model is that we have some number of replicas. One of these is the primary. That's the little one with the crown. So that's our, our leader. Uh, I found these slides. I was like, that's actually really cool. There's a link on the bottom of the slides to the original source. I'm not going to take credit for them. And it took me a little while to like walk through and, and realize exactly what this is doing, but it's really cool. So we are going to introduce this idea of a view, but, but let's just start with a brand new system. This is your project three at the very beginning. So you pick... Instead of picking a primary and a backup, and now we pick a primary and two backups, because that's basically what it is. Okay, so what we want is a system 
where we can tolerate some number of nodes failing at the same time, or overlapping in time. It doesn't have to be exactly simultaneous. So you could fail on this message, and I'll fail on the next one, and that's that's perfectly acceptable if we're both in fail states at the same time. And so the simplest of these models, and I've mentioned this before, is three, because that means I can absorb one of these nodes failing. And that's the quorum model. We can get more complicated models, and it makes it harder for us to reason about, but as long as we get this model working, we'll prove the rest by induction. Hand wave, hand wave, hand wave. Ever done inductive proofs? It's the inductive step that's always a really hard one. You know, the initial step is really easy. The inductive step is really hard. And usually what you end up doing is assuming that it's not true and then proving it by contradiction, which actually takes us in this very strange part of mathematics that overlaps with um, philosophy. Logic is an outgrowth of philosophy and mathematics, which were the same field initially. Kind of cool. But at any rate, I'm not even going to go through a formal proof. Go to the paper if you really want that. Um, but this does work. It's the same thing as V-stamp for is, um, a quorum replication. We walked through quorum replication. We talked about how you're taking quorum. I pointed at crumbling walls, which is just a generalization of that. It doesn't even have to be a majority. And that's what's really cool. Gifford allowed you to give different weights to different nodes in the system. Here, everybody gets one vote, which is why we need an odd number. If you want to do it with even numbers, usually what you end up doing is picking some node and giving them extra. And it's going to be your primary. And that's how you break it in, a, in the two case. The primary holds the extra vote. But it doesn't have this failure tolerance that we're looking for. Because if the primary goes down in a two-node system, as you know, we had to introduce that view server in there to fix things. Well, Liskov is going to do exactly the same thing. When Barbara Liskov retired, um, the senior woman in systems research and computer science became Margot Seltzer. And I think Liskov retired about 15 years ago. All right, so basic flow. The client sends a request to the leader. Same as we've, we've seen before. Nothing fancy here. We have an operation. Oh, set the value x equal to 18. We have a client identifier that indicates where it came from. Nothing really surprising there. And then we have a Lamport clock. So this is request zero. And that goes to the leader. So what does the leader do? Well, the leader says, OK, I'm going to put this in my list of things that are pending. So it has updated its database, but it has not yet committed this change because it doesn't have a quorum. So what it then does is it sends a message to the replicas and says, I'm in view 0 because we haven't changed views yet. That's where things will get interesting. This is operation 1, and it's not a commit. And then we pass the request along. In this case, it's you know we're asking it to set the value of x to 18. Each of the replicas then, not necessarily at exactly the same time, but for our purposes, we'll just consider it that way for the moment. Each of those replicas updates their internal state to say, I have this pending operation, but it's not committed yet. And they say, OK. And we're using the language of two-phase commit here, prepare OK. Kind of not, it's not exactly the same. It's, we just want it to be slightly different so it's more confusing. As opposed to choosing a completely different set of terminology, which, of course, is just as confusing. Think about Lamport's learners and acceptors. So in, in Lamport, in Paxos, it was um, you know, proposals. Well, that's basically what we're doing here. We're proposing a change, but we're, we're doing it as an operation. And we pass it with this, this prepare request. And then the replicas say, yeah, I'm good with this. We still don't have agreement yet, because remember, it's just like two-phase commit, where 
Only the leader gets to ultimately make the decision there. The coordinator of the transaction is the one who's going to say, okay, now we can commit it. Liskov was a very practical CS person. She was a very practical systems person. She was building stuff when hardware, was, you know, when 4K of memory was a lot of memory on a machine. So one of the interesting things they chose to do here is um, they chose not to commit the transaction immediately. And when I first looked at this, I was, I was like, OK, so how are you going to deal with that failure? And, and that, that is, in fact, the interesting part here. So this protocol is very sparse in its use of messages. It tries not to send extra messages. Why? Well, because in 1988, you were talking about 10 megabit Ethernet. And if anything was very far away, it took a while to get there. You have this latency. So if I require an extra message before I can move forward, I'm adding extra latency. I'm making things slower. So she didn't do that. Well, they didn't do that. The interesting thing here is that the primary doesn't have to wait for acknowledgments from all of the replicas. It only has to wait for enough acknowledgments from the replicas to guarantee it has that quorum. Since we have two replicas and the primary, it only needs to get an acknowledgment from one of the replicas to be able to move forward. And move forward here means I can now answer the client. The moment I make it visible to the client, it has to be committed. So the primary, the leader, commits the change in its own, in its own log, its own database, and tells the client, yep, done. Your operation is done. And the client now knows that the state of the world is that x is equal to 18, at least at the moment that message was sent, because who knows what other people are doing to it. But we don't have to solve that particular problem. This is great. But you're probably sitting here going, well, wait a minute. Neither of the replicas know that this is transaction is actually committed. So we haven't actually told. We haven't actually told the replicas that this transaction is committed yet. And we're going to actually have to walk through that failure case, aren't we? If you were sitting there going, but what if A crashes? You're asking exactly the right question. And if you didn't sit there and go, wait a minute, then I'm not doing my job. I want you to keep thinking about failure. Because that's what matters here. That's what we're trying to protect ourselves against. And we are going to walk through that case. Because it's actually very interesting. And that's the complicated part. And it's exactly the right way to make this model complicated. It's the hardest to test. But it's exactly the right one from a performance perspective, which is you do as little work as possible in the common case. Because in the common case, nothing fails. All you have to do is make sure that when something does fail, you can get back to a consistent state. And that's what's going to be important. The primary is going to piggyback its commit on the next request. As you'll see later on, in fact, what they did in, in the actual implementation was they set a timer. And if they didn't get another request within their timer, then they would just send a, a, a naked commit. So, And this is a technique, a trick I've used many times, where if you've got a steady supply of things going on, you can get rid of an extra message by piggybacking. But if you stop that, you just send the extra message. And the reason that pays off is because if you're not getting an inbound list of requests, you're not saturating your network. It doesn't matter. So it's this like interesting trick where, well, I can procrastinate that until tomorrow because maybe I'll be able to piggyback it on top of something else. Nobody in here procrastinates anything, though, right? We've learned this trick. We've internalized this trick because if you defer it far enough, maybe it just won't matter and you don't have to do it at all. Nope, oh, sorry, the deadline's passed, don't care. Done, move on. Okay, so the client sends a new request. This is, again, the normal flow. 
The client sends a new request. We've committed that transaction. We've got, um, this is now request number one from client 136. We're still in view zero. So nothing's really that different. And what it does is it sends a message to each of the replicas. And it says, oh, and by the way, I committed one. And so now you know that everything from one and earlier is committed. So notice we can actually piggyback multiple operations this way. And it's very terse. We didn't actually have to give them a lot of information about what, what happened. We just gave them just one value. And you have a question. That's the transaction number. If you remember when we sent that, uh, we sent, uh, it, it says OP here, but um, so that was operation one. So we committed operation one. And remember, since we maintain the ordering of these, committing one means anything before it has been committed as well. So if that had been a commit six, it would have said every transaction up through transaction six has now been committed. Question in the back. Um, you have to abort it, but normal. Okay, so so in view stamp replication, they're only doing failure failure aborts. They're not doing runtime abort. So this isn't like a two-phase commit protocol that allows you to do runtime abort and abort a transaction. You'd end up with a different protocol in that case. So this is very narrow and very focused. And it's a, that's a really good question. It's very narrow and very focused on the only time we really want to do anything complicated is when we are recovering. And it's fun to look at this and to say, wow, in 1989, I didn't know about this paper, but in 1989, I'm sitting here designing a transactional system, and I did exactly the same thing. Because you don't want to increase the amount of, I mean, in this case, I'm using disks. You don't want to increase the number of times I have to wait for a disk to finish an I.O. I literally had a model where I would queue the I.O., and then I would just, just keep going. And I'd only try to reason about things, and I'd only try to block and wait when I absolutely had to. And that's because it was a very efficient way of doing that. I mean, we do things asynchronously for a reason. The biggest reason is because it helps us paper over the latency cost of messaging. If I have to send and wait, it's way slower than if I just send and go do something else. So let's see. And, da, 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 and this is where I was, right? So I've sent the commit. I thought this was so cool. I'm looking at this and going, this is great, okay. But in fact, I'm still sitting there in the back of my head going through these slides going, wait a minute. What do I do if A fails? We're going to get there. Whoa. This is just the common case. This is everything works fine. But at least the protocol does work here. And it seems to be reasonably efficient. So. So they send a response to the, to the prepare. They commit the transaction they've been told by the leader is now committed. So now that's persistent in their database. So we have the information we are going to need in order to be able to form a quorum if we need one for recovery. Did you have a question? I wasn't sure if you were stretching or, or actually like this was like, oh, my arm is so heavy today. They haven't, they haven't committed the transaction they were asked to prepare. But they have committed the transaction that, that the leader has said is now committed. That's why it has that little green check mark next to the, the, the previous one, but not the current one. The second one is in your database, but it's not committed yet, right? So it's in your pending commit queue. Okay. That's correct. The op field is what are we trying to prepare? But, but we're, we're being very very um, efficient in our use of our message now because we just used one extra field to keep track of what, what's my current commit level. No, you could, commit, you could commit further back than that. You could have multiple in-flight transactions. But for the purposes of trying to walk you through this in the simple case, we're not, we didn't show that. right? But um, if you have multiple clients, sending in requests, 
those commits might actually be uh, might might be lagging further because you have multiple outstanding prepare repairs, right? But that's that's essentially saying I know that it's committed up to this point. There might be some stuff that's in flight, but up to this point, everything here has been committed. Gosh, I wish I'd known this in 1989. I wouldn't have had to reinvent this myself. Um, and I was just doing it on a local system, right, with a disk, where I needed to have uh, recovery in case the, the system crashed. Because computers do crash occasionally. So, um, but what happens if the next prepare never comes? Or it, it takes a while to get there. So that's when we use a, a timer. We can just send a commit message. You see, we have a number of different messages here. They have kind of the same, or generally some of the same fields. So we have duplicate fields in some of these messages. But each of these messages is different. The way we process it is slightly different. So in the commit message, all I'm doing is saying, I'm in view zero, and I'm committing transactions through two. And so what's going to happen now is the replicas are going to update their database to say this transaction is committed. So here's the interesting part. Even though we have a transaction in our database that's not committed, when we start doing failure recovery, we're going to be able to read those values and figure out if we have a quorum. That's how we're going to replace our leader if it fails. And that's the key here to the understanding of what's going on. We have consistency. We didn't send extra messages. We made this pretty efficient. It's pretty straightforward. I liked this. I was like, this is cool. But of course, I haven't actually thrown any failures in here yet. We've been mumbling about failures, but I haven't thrown any fail failures in here yet. So let's actually do some failures. And just to remind you, in quorum consensus, the leader can wait for less than all of the other replicas because we only need the quorum number uh, plus one to be failure resistant against a single failure. So if the leader knows about it and one of the replicas knows about it, I don't care if the other replica knows about it yet or not, because that gives me a quorum. Because two of the three participants in this transaction have recorded their transaction. Even if the one replica doesn't know that it's committed yet, we at least have that information recorded. So if we have to reconstruct what happened, we can determine that there was a quorum. Now here's the really screwy part. If either one of the two guys that already know about it drop out, when we do recovery, we still know that we've got a quorum. But I'm going to walk through that because I've got the slide, because that one is a little harder to conceptualize. Because it's. But did you have a question in the back? All right. So there are read quorums and write quorums. And the point is that we need to have an intersection of the read quorum and the write quorum to know that we actually have a committed value. So in our case, we end up with a right quorum, even in this case. So let's say we have our leader and we have a failed node, and that's where our right quorum was. Well, we still know our leader marked it as com committed, and so we still know that um, that the transaction was in a quorum. Because we're not trying to reason necessarily about what the quorum is now. We're trying to reason about what was the quorum when we committed the transaction. The read quorum here would be the two nodes that didn't die that do actually have persistent copies of that. Now, the interesting case here isn't where B or C fail, because that one's pretty easy. You know, the, 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 the leader has the transaction, they've marked it as committed. Okay. That means that the leader knew that there was a quorum. The interesting case here is going to be when A fails. And that's the case that we're going to spend the most time walking through because that's the case where you go, but wait a minute. 
how am I going to make this all work together? Um, so in the case where I have a failure and I have to reason about it, a client can verify the quorum by trying to read all of the nodes that, that are in the system and notice that, it, oh, look, I have a read quorum here. You have a question in the back. Um, so remember, in order for us to actually have a quorum consensus, we have to have a, an overlap between the read quorum and the write quorum. So you could argue that they are all read and write quorum aura, but in this case, and this is back to, to quorum replication. Maybe I didn't do a good enough job in quorum replications explanation, but in quorum replication, and in crumbling walls, which is, a, which is a, the generalization of, of Gifford's work, the way that we succeeded was having at least one writer and all the readers, or at least all the writers and one reader. And in either case, that gave us an intersection between the two quorum. Now, what's confusing here, I think, is that, in fact, we haven't really distinguished that some of these nodes are readers and some of them are writers, because in our example, they are all readers and writers. So in some ways, that simplifies it, but it makes it harder to reason about because we just put a picture around here. I don't have to have all of the members of that quorum. I just have to have enough of the members of that quorum to know that I had a read, read quorum or I had a write quorum. Does that make sense? And it is the intersection between the two that gets to define what the outcome of the operation was. And in this case, the, out, the, the intersection here just happens to be A because it's in both the read quorum and the write quorum. We can't have a read quorum because B failed, right? So B, we can't read from B, but that's okay. If B were alive, we'd be able to get a read quorum by reading BC or AC or AB, any of the subsets of that. And those would be enough for us to be able to validate that we have a consensus. Does this make any sense? I know it's. Then we wouldn't have a quorum. That's correct. We wouldn't have a read quorum. But if A is alive still and A is our leader, then A is going to have in its database that this was committed. And that means that at some point A did have the quorum. Like I said, the only interesting failure case here is where A, the, uh, the coordinator, actually fails. In which case, then we're going to have to do some fancy footwork to put all of this stuff back together. It's great to push the complicated stuff into recovery. It makes developing this software a bitch. There's no other way to describe it because the only cases you're going to have to spend a lot of time debugging are all the failure cases. And failures don't happen very often. So you're going to end up trying to simulate those failures so they happen a lot more often. Welcome to the DS Labs framework. In order for us to be able to recover, we're going to introduce this concept of a view. The client sends a new request. So this is a different client, and therefore we get the same request number, which is fine, not a problem. And we are setting a different value, the Y value. We're going to set it to 100, and we send that to the leader. The leader says, uh, updates its database, and then sends the messages to um, the replicas. It sends the request, the prepare request, it sends to C, and then it fails before it sends the one to B. OK. Hmm. How are we going to deal with this? Now we have inconsistent logs. Because A's database said that Y is equal to 100. C's database says that Y is equal to 100. But B's database doesn't have an entry for Y. So A's dead, out of the picture. So we have one log that says Y is equal to 100. The other log doesn't even know what Y is. How are we going to fix this? 
Oh dear. I don't know. We could just throw up our hands and go, I don't know, just reinstall the database and start all over again. There were people who liked that model in project three. Well, you know, if the primary fails and they don't have a backup, just pick a different database and let's run with it. That was a bad answer. You don't want to do that, right? We want consistency. We haven't told the client about this yet. So remember, actually either outcome here is going to be okay as long as we can agree on what that outcome was. Because we haven't told the client what it is yet. And eventually the client's going to get impatient, stamp their little foot, and go, excuse me, I sent this operation before and you haven't answered me. Question in the back. It's after the leader commits. The leader hasn't committed. He didn't get an, he didn't get an acknowledgement back from, from C, right? So C has C has updated the value, but didn't acknowledge it back to the leader. We don't. Oh, how would we know that in, in this walkthrough, in this example, A has not committed it yet because it didn't receive an answer from C. Yes, but we can walk through all of those different cases. But we won't make it and get it done by 9.15. But I think you'll just barrel on a little bit longer, and I think we'll get there. So now our, 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 our primary, our leader, has failed. Oh, no! Um, well, C notices, hey, you're not talking to me. You know? I expected to get either another request or a commit or something to let me know that you're not dead. And so C, who's not the leader, now says, uh, okay, I think something's wrong here. So I'm going to ask for a new view. Remember our view server in project three? It's kind of the same idea, except that this time our view, we don't have an explicitly separate view server. Managing the view is something that we do collectively together. But it's the same basic concept. How do we know when the state of our world has changed? And what's the worst that happens? I declare a new view, and we end up back with a view, new view that looks pretty much like the old view, because things got better before we managed to fix everything. So we need to elect a new leader. Um, who is that new primary? So in fact, the way that Liskov and uh, Oki solved this is the, way I, it's the only way I've ever actually seen it solved in real world. I didn't realize that it was from this work until last night when I was going through this slides. Oh, so that's why I was always told, well, we'll just use the lowest IP address or highest. It doesn't really matter. I mean, we could have broken the tie in other ways. We just need to, to have a, a leader. Um, if you remember, in Paxos, we made it a lot more complicated because we voted for the leader. Like, really? And so we don't have to use the IP address. We use a different mechanism. I think it's just really easy to say, everybody knows where everybody else's IP address is, so this is super easy. Because I know all of the participants in my replication scheme. And I know what their IP addresses are because I have to talk to them. So this is information that's part of the configuration. It's unique on a per node basis, and it provides us with an easy tiebreaker. So whoever's got the um, highest IP address, I guess it was, or lowest, I don't know which, but it doesn't matter. As long as we all implement the same, same state machine, we're fine. Um, so we pick the next leader. So let's say we make B the leader, because that's kind of the interesting case, because C has that state, B doesn't have that state, and we're going to now pick a, di a different leader. Now remember in our primary backup example, we kept them very much in sync so that if the primary failed, the backup could immediately take over. But now we have multiple backups. So what happens if a backup takes over that hasn't actually acknowledged this thing? It hasn't actually, didn't even know about this request yet. C knows about it, but B doesn't. Here's the interesting thing. If C knows about it and B doesn't, and A is gone, B, when we're reconstructing things, will know that C was part of um, the right quorum. And that's going to be our ticket out. 
that's going to be how we're going to fix things. So, the way that we fix this is we start a view change. So, C is going to change its view. It's going to send out a, a start view change message, message, SVC. Since I stole the picture, I didn't fix the text. I would have spelled it out. Just acronyms always kind of confuse me when I'm first looking at something. I had one of those in one of the papers last night. I had to keep looking backwards to figure out what the acronym is meant. And it's, it makes it really hard to read things. And you're sitting there going back six pages to try and figure out what does SIMD mean in this context? Not single instruction, multiple data, which is what I always think of when I see SIMD. You can tell I've worked with processors. So C sends a message to B. And it says, let's start a view change. I'm going to increment the view to number one. And I'm replica two. And since B is the leader, B is the one who actually has to agree to this. But it's going to, because it's going to say, um, yeah, this sounds fine to me. Um, let's see. So when I receive a, a, a start view change request, then if the view number is greater than my number, then I say, yes, I'm going to enter a view change. So now you see how we're going to break ties here. Um, the leader is going to have to be the one that breaks that tie, though. So we only, can only have one decision maker here, maker here. It's our new leader, not the dead leader. They've been shot, and um, their head is on a pike on the castle wall. Or... All right, I've watched a little too much Game of Thrones. I have the one that has George Bush's head on a pike outside of the... Did you even... Yeah. They, I don't know, the props people pulled it out of storage and just used it, and somebody eventually noticed it, and then um, HBO had to change it and take it out. Uh, great. So, leader, fearless leader, immortal leader is dead. Long live the new leader. So the new leader says, yeah, I'm, I'm good with the view change. Life's good. Here's the new view number. And I'm the new leader, because I'm replica one, so my IP address is the winner. Um, and then I send that message back to, to C. Now, obviously, if things go wonky here, recovery might get a little more complicated, but that's because we now have, the, have exceeded our threshold of tolerable failures, right? We said we'd handle one failure. If C fails while we're trying to fix this thing, sorry, that isn't an automated recovery. That's when you go get your backup tapes and you start fixing things the old-fashioned way. Um, so once we receive start, uh, enough start view changes, because this is the case where we actually have more than two replicas. We have multiple replicas. We have to send out these start view changes to everybody. Once we get acknowledgments back from all of them that they've, that they've started their view change, life is good. Um, we send the do view change. So that's interesting. Okay, so I hadn't really thought about this when I was putting these slides together last night, but for the purposes of starting a view change, it's the node that initiates the view change that collects the votes. To that extent, it's very much like the proposers in Paxos. I'm now going to collect up those votes and I'm going to send them back out. Once I have enough nodes saying that they're, they're willing to start a view change, then I send a message that says, OK, we are changing the view. I collected the votes. I have enough votes. Let's go do this. So a do view change now says, I'm replica two. This is view number one. The last operation I know of is number three. I committed number two. So see everything there. And here's my log. So here's my uncommitted transactions as well. We're trying to get everybody back into sync. Node B gets, the, gets that. It says, yeah, my, my world is, remember, so uh, in my world, I had uh, transaction two committed. 
But I didn't know about transaction three. But now I do. And the whole purpose of this was to get our logs back into sync. Since Replica 2 knew about that request, Replica 1 didn't know about that request, now they both know about that request, now they are back into sync, and we now actually have a consistent state of the world. Simple. That's why I liked it. When I was done with this, why is this not what we teach first? Why are we teaching Paxos first? In fact, I had a hard time finding people who taught this at all. I'm going, but this makes a lot of sense to me. Hopefully it's making sense to you too. And it's making more sense as I go through it and actually have to explain it. So it's fun. All right, so now we start our new primary. Well, we, because remember, the, uh, it was based on the address of the, of the, uh, the surviving nodes. Um, so now the new primary says, okay, life is good. We are going to all be using this new view. So remember, it was um, uh, start view change, do view change, start view is now the operation. So the leader, our new leader, long may it live, sends out a message to everybody else in the collective. Now I feel like I'm talking about Borg. Um, and which is Paxos, not view stamp replication. And and we're going we're gonna to use this new view number. So now we actually have a way of showing that we have moved from the old state to a new state with a new leader, and everyone has the same starting position. This is our new view. So we have done a, a view change. And that's why this is called view stamp replication. Question in the back. The view number resets. Uh, what do you mean? No, no, we were on view zero. The view number only changes when we actually have to recover from failure. The transaction number, the op number, when I redo these slides and I actually draw these out, I will probably try to make the terminology a little more consistent. But here where it says op is a transaction ID. This is the, the view number just reset as we... So the, the, the sequence was the replica that noticed that A is dead sent out a start view change request. Yep. Okay. Yeah, no, it's, it, he's the one who proposes changing it to view 1. Now, in fact, we can have races here, and we could end up with view 47 but it doesn't make any difference. We're going to eventually come to a new view number. And that view number will be another Lamport clock in here where it's, it's bigger and therefore we know that anything before that is just garbage. And we can ignore it if it comes in late. All right, you never roll back the view numbers, right? It's, it's the same thing. You never roll back the transaction IDs. The clients, a new client comes on board, they can then deal with that. And, and there is a whole discussion in the paper about how you bring in new nodes so you can bring in new replicas and how you fit those into the transactional system and whatnot. But um, the things that we depend on as a collective should never roll backwards. A new client can come in and start with, with their, their own sequence number of zero, and we can handle that correctly. But when we are talking internally, we are going to be using that clock that the leader controls that says, this is operation three, operation four, operation 314. Because I always use approximations of pi, because I can remember that to about 10 digits. Question? Awesome. So the question is, if we had more replicas, but not enough. We had like five, or I guess let's, let's say we have four. Right, so then we would have had five. When we... Right, so we had the primary. We have four replicas, and only one of them has a copy of that transaction. One of them has a copy of that, uh, that log. Then, in fact, the leader gets to decide, don't they? 
they get to decide whether they're going to accept or not accept that transaction. Mm -hmm. The new leader. So, here's the, so one of the things that's going to get us out of this is there's no wrong answer there. If the new leader wants to simply take all of the transactions that, that the old leader had sent out and incorporate them and then update that, you can make that, that. I think that is, in fact, what they would normally do. Because remember, when, we, when we're down by one, our recovery model is, or our, our failure model only allows the failure of one. So we know that nothing can fail in our recovery window. We don't automatically recover from that. So even if only one of those replicas were to have received that request, you, could, you can successfully then replicate it across all of the nodes. Because remember, when the, when the replica that requested the view change sent out messages, it sent out a message and included its log. So it can now propagate those. Does that make sense? And I think I can probably go back and figure out a way of reconstructing this, but it wouldn't be quite the same protocol. I could probably go back and reconstruct this from, from the model that, because you have to do this when you get multiple failure handling, uh, how I'm going to reason about that. In other words, I could roll back that transaction. But there's no benefit to it, right? We know that the client asked for it. And so we are just trying to recover. So rolling that transaction forward, or rolling that operation forward, and, and thus rolling that transaction forward, actually is probably the simplest way to solve this. We know as long as it was received by one of these replicas, it was originally received by the primary, and it was sent out. Things get hairier when we start trying to do something trickier, like rolling backwards. Because a board is hard. It really is. And if you can avoid rolling state backwards, it almost always ends up being a, uh, a net payoff. But we can make that, I, I can make that work, but I'm, we're not going to do that in the slide system, or in the, these slides. We'd have to tell everybody that that transaction was not committed. So we'd have to have an abort protocol. And in view stamp replication, there's no abort protocol. It's just a recovery protocol, yeah. Start a new primary, um, and this we have to reconcile our transactions. Did we commit that? Uh, so this is what we were just talking about, in fact. So I was wrong. We do have a slide about it. Uh, so we have to have a decision here. Well, you can say yes, or you can say no. And I think that's why I said, it. yes, I think is the easiest answer is just yes, commit the transaction because somebody saw it, therefore it really was a request from a client. But you could roll it backwards as well and not acknowledge it. But now we need to use the view number and the transaction number. We're going to have to actually have a little bit of extra state there. Since, so, so the question boils down to what do we do with transactions that were recorded under an old view do we commit them or not? We have to guarantee the committed ops. We can't roll that backwards. That's going to, going to break our consistency model. In this instance, we can make it consistent with either answer, which is why the, the, you can do it either direction and make it work. The simplest thing here in our three, three node model is just roll it forward. As long as we end up with the same database, again, it's the consistency that we care about. We haven't told the client the outcome for this. We still haven't told the client the outcome for this. The client's going to end up going, yo, uh, I sent in this operation. What happened? And we're going, to have to, we're going to have to give it that answer. So you'll notice that means there's some state here that's not quite explicit on the slide because you don't want to overwhelm somebody walking through these slides initially. So the summary of the view changes, because this is really the key to view stamp replication, is we pick the new primary based upon the IP address. Um, a change, a view change can be initiated by any of the nodes. It could easily be initiated by multiple replicas. That's fine. There's no problem with that. We need to wait until we get enough votes for our view change for us to say, OK, I collected my votes. Now we're going to change to this new view. We tell the leader to start the view. Well, we tell everybody to do, start the view change. And then the leader is going to be the one who actually 
sends the message out that says, okay, we are now on view number um, n plus m. So some number larger than the previous view. And since it's a quarter past, I'm going to wrap it up at this point. There's, ah, never mind. I'll just do the lesson review. We talked about, you know, our, our leader model, our primary receives the request, maintains the database, forwards requests to the replicas. The replicas can fail and restart in this model, which is really kind of nice. Um, they can drop off, they can come back, they can get, they, they can get the, uh, the data. So they can synchronize their logs. That's going to be what ultimately allows view stamp replication to add replicas, which is cool. Um, and views are used to handle leader failure. This is a really nice extension to quorum replication. It gives us a mechanism for efficiently recovering. And honestly, I can see why somebody came along 20 years later and said, this is a lot more understandable than Paxos. Um, so what I'm going to do next time is I'm going to walk through Raft, because that's what most people will call this. So they'll be talking about Raft. And then I'm going to talk about the comparisons between them, because there's a lot of similarities in the techniques that we are using in Raft and view stamp replication and, and Paxos. They're all trying to solve the same problem. And there are times we will want to use one versus the other. View stamp replication and Raft are popular because they're easier to understand. Paxos is effective because it doesn't require a single leader. I mean, in our model, we just we, we have a single leader. Paxos has a whole leader election mechanism, and you can have multiple proposers. So each proposer is effectively a leader in our system, and uh, multiple acceptors. So acceptors are part of the read quorum. And, and, and when you actually look at the way that Paxos ends up getting implemented, all of the nodes end up being proposers, acceptors, and listeners. Actually, acceptors are write quorum. Listeners are read quorum. Be careful about that. All right, and that's it. So I'll ha happily answer questions, but gosh, I managed to get through a slide deck in one lecture. This is a record. This is why I didn't add Raft on top of this. I was like, this is a lot of slides. So...